Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Michelle Desikin. I'm one of the international student advisors at the ISSO, and I'm here today with my colleague, Alexis, who will introduce herself now. Hello, everyone. Congratulations on finishing the semester. My name is Alexis Lakagawa, and I am so pleased to be here with you. We are so happy to speak with you today about OPT. And Alexis and I have a lot of information that we'd love to share with you. So stay tuned for a really uh, robust hour presentation on OPT specifics. Thank you, Alexis. So we are going to talk about OPT. And yes, in this immigration advising world, we use a lot of acronyms, and this is one of our favorites. At the end of our time today, we hope you will feel comfortable with the OPT process and we hope you will leave our presentation feeling confident and empowered and ready when the time comes to submit your OPT application. We know this is an important step in your F1 journey, as you will take all the knowledge that you will have learned here at Columbia and apply that to future employment in the US. Our goal today is to provide you with the tools and resources you'll need to know to make sure you have informed decisions as you plan your next steps. We wanna help you navigate this jungle of immigration regs which can at times seems overwhelming. So we hope that throughout your journey that you've used um, throughout your studies here that you've always used the resources here at ISSO. And just know that we are always here to answer your immigration related questions as best we can. So please note that um, the information that we're gonna be covering today is, is for those specifically in F1 who are considering the option to work in the US after graduation. All the information covered today is explained in greater detail on our webpage. We also have a webinar recording from last semester online. There will be two more OPT webinars later this month as well. So you have a lot of great information at your fingertips. So let's get started. So if this sounds like you, we see some questions here that I'm sure a lot of you have been thinking about uh, throughout this semester. Um, first of all, um, you know, on behalf of all of us at the ISSO, we just want to say to all our December 2023 20, uh, fall graduates that you are almost there, right? Congrats on making it this far in your program. We know you've put in a lot of hard work over the years in your program of study, and, and you're almost done. So we wish you all the best as you complete this final term. And for those who are listening but may not be graduating soon, we're happy that you're taking um, this time, getting a head start so you can plan out your future. So next we'd like to have, a, we have a little poll that we'd like to um, share with you some questions, um, just so we can get a better sense of you know, who we have here today. So the three questions that we have, uh, we'd like to know, are you in your final semester? Have you applied for OPT, OPT before? And we'd love to know what uh, degree level you are pursuing here at uh, Columbia. So take, a um, take this time and answer those questions. Um, and as people are answering, I just want to let you all know that we have a lot of information we're going to cover over the next hour. So we really appreciate your undivided attention during the presentation. We're going to ask that you please hold off submitting any questions at this time, as questions will be answered um, at the end of our presentation. We believe most of um, the questions you may have will be answered during our presentation. But if you do have any case-specific questions, please feel free to email us at ISSO at columbia.edu, and we'll be happy to go over your particular uh, questions. You know, we know each person's case can be so different, so we really want to take that time to review your record before we can give you a thorough response. Um, but if you do think of some questions that you think will be beneficial, beneficial to the to everyone who's listening here today, then please make a mental note and hold off until the end, and we'll be happy to address it then. So I don't know if um, the poll, oh yeah, here are the results. Okay, great, so let's see what we have. It looks like uh, most of you are in your final semester. Okay, 77%. We have some who are not finishing now, but that's okay. So for those who will be finishing this December, um, throughout the presentation, we're going to use uh, date specific to the December graduates, just for an example, since most of you are finishing in December. Um, and it looks like most of you have not done OPT before, but a few have. So, you know, it's always good. I mean, you may have had experience about the OPT process, but it's always good to see where things are now because immigration regulations can always change, as you know. So glad that you're here as well. Um, and let's see here, in terms of degrees, we have 
not that many bachelors, like the majority of you are masters, which is not surprising because a lot of our students do are in the master's program are here for three semesters finishing this December. Um, we have a couple of PhDs and certificate. One thing I'll say about the PhDs, um, as a doctoral student, um, it's just important to know that you have some flexibility in determining your program end date. So you may you may be able to use your defense date or uh, your deposit date or the end of the term where you complete requirements. So as these dates can vary, um, and there's so many factors that we need to consider, we really ask that you reach out to our office directly, set up a, a virtual appointment, and we can go over your particular case. All right, so now that we know uh, who's joining us today, let's move on and talk about optional practical training, right? Um, OPT, so what is this OPT? Um, what I think is important to note is that this is a benefit of your F1 staff. Status. Um, and a lot of people confuse that, oh, now that I'm on OBT, it's a different visa status or something like that, but that's not the case. When you're under your OPT, you are still in F1 status. OPT is a work authorization, right? It allows you to remain in the United States after graduation to work in your field of study. So this is what we refer to as post-completion OPT. You get 12 months of OPT at each higher degree level. If you've used a portion of your time while studying in your program before graduation, then you'll only get the remaining time left of the 12 months after graduation. Um, we have a great resource on our webpage that can help you calculate your time if, if that's your situation. And so we please just make sure you use our OPT calculator that's available to you. I'll also say that this is, um, when we talk about employment, we, we it's always important to make sure it's always directly related to your field of study, and you are the one responsible for explaining that connection, if ever asked by the government. You should feel comfortable explaining how what you've studied is related to the work that you will do under OPT. And the great thing about the OPT is that there are many types of employment allowed, so there's a lot of flexibility. And our webpage has a very good section on the different types of employment, so please take a look at that later. You can work for one or more employers. You can be self-employed or employed through a staffing agency. You can also do paid or unpaid work as long as it's not violating any labor laws. You just need to make sure you're working at least 20 hours a week or more in your field of study. Now, in terms of eligibility, you must be enrolled as a full-time degree or qualifying certificate program and active F1 status for at least one year. Um, and that means being full time for two consecutive semesters. You must also arrive in the US within 30 days from the start of classes during your first semester of entry in order for that term to count towards your practical training eligibility. And you must be in the US at the time of submitting your application to the government, okay? So as an example, most of our master's students, um, I'm going to since so many of you are in the master's program, most of you probably will have started um, in fall of 2022. So as long as you entered within 30 days of the start of the fall 22 semester and maintained your full-time registration, fall 2022 or spring 2023, and now you're finishing up in um, your degree requirements this fall, you'd be eligible for OPT. One more thing I'd like to mention before I go into the, the two steps of the process is that um, some people may think uh, have questions about STEM OPT. Now, if you're eligible for STEM OPT, please note that at this time, you're only applying for post-completion OPT for those 12 months. Once you've been approved for that OPT, then those who qualify uh, for a STEM uh, extension may then apply for that additional 24 months. So that is a separate application. It's not something you have to think about now. And you can definitely go to our webpage to learn more about that process. So if you look here at the OPT application, there's two steps, as you can see. We try to make it really simple for you. <laughs> the first step is to submit your application to ISSO. Once you submit your application to us, we will then process and give you a new I-20 we'll call this the OPT I-20, right? Because that's going to have the information of the OPT on it. Um, this is all done online. So um, it's a very simple process in that way. Then once you get that I-20 from our office, you will then have to submit another, that application along with other supporting documents to USCIS. 
which stands for the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So this is the agency that's going to adjudicate your case and decide whether or not to approve you and give you this EAD, okay? Now, what is the EAD? So if we look here, the EAD stands for Employment Authorization Document, right? Another acronym that we use very often. So this is key to your legal employment in the US. The EAD card is the final step in the application process. So only when you have that EAD card in hand, within and there are certain dates printed on the card, a time period, can you then begin your employment, okay? So this is the card you must present to an employer to show that you have been given authorization to work in the US. So it's very important, it's a very important document and you wanna make sure you don't lose that. So we will now take you on a journey, right? Now that you understand the OPT eligibility, uh, the overall goal of what we're trying to get here is that EAD card, let's now take a look at the process. So we are now going to meet John, okay? He works for USCIS and he receives tons of OPT applications every year, huge volume. They receive 26,000 pieces of mail every day. You just take a moment to take that in, right? That's a lot. He's a government worker uh, with no connection to the ISSO, right? So he's a very busy individual. He has a lot to process and he is gonna be processing your OPT application. So here is your application. And for you, we know how important this is to you, but it is one of many. And actually, it is one of many 8 million um, applications that are adjudicated every year by USCIS. So you're in a sea of thousands of applications. There is only one processing center in the country that specifically deals with OPT applications that come from all the higher ed institutions. And just to give you some context, our student advising team, which Alexis and I are part of, consists of 18 staff members, and we have 13 advisors that will be processing these OPT I-20s. We have a processing time of 10 business days. At this time, we have about 5,000 students that are on OPT currently or STEM OPT, and we are still responsible for all their records as well. So, you know, we are, um, you know, we're with you for a few years after your graduation because we're still responsible for your records. But as you can see, our office is pretty busy. And depending on the volume um, the, of applications that we're receiving, you may get the I-20 from us within um, five or six days, or it may take more, but it's within 10 business days, right? So we're working very hard to get that to you on time. But just like we ask you to give us that time to process, it is the same for USCIS, but on a much larger scale. So as you can see here, um, the USCIS processing time can vary, and it depends on the person reviewing your application. They do process in the order in which they are received. And usually we would say you should give it about three to four months for this process to take place. It can be more, it can be less. We just don't know for sure. So we don't, we can't say anything more than once we do our part, then, you, then you're gonna send it to the um, USCIS, and then you have to wait. Um, but what a good thing is that you can check the processing time on their webpage to find out, to get a better sense of how long it's taking. So that's a good thing. Now, this is a in time to empower yourself, right? You're going to strategize, see what's best for you. You're going to take all the information and tips that we give you, think through this, see how this is going to work in your particular case, because everyone's situation is so different, and then come up with a plan. Now, Definitely there are things that we can't control, right? We don't know how long it's going to take to process. There are jo the job market. You're not sure when that ideal job that you want is going to be available. Um, and there's the rules, immigration regs that we have to adhere to. So even though we have things that we cannot control, there are definitely things that we can. And so what we're going to talk about today is the importance of what you can control. We can talk about how the importance of applying early, the importance of choosing that start date, right? It's very important. 
a day that everyone's trying to figure out what that is for them. And how the importance of using that ISSO website that has such comprehensive information that's going to help you through this process. And then we'll have time for Q&A. So hold on to your questions for the end. All right, apply early. This is tip number one. You're going to hear this from us all the time. But what does this mean? What does early mean? Right? So let's take a look at um, an example of just their time frame here, the OPT timeline. Since most of you said you're going to be completing this December, we're going to use the program end date for December grads, which is December 22nd, 2023. So given that that is your program end date. Now, if for some reason your I-20 is into the future, but you're like, actually, I'm finishing now, that's fine. We're going to adjust that when you submit your application to us, and we will reflect that on your I-20. So if it needs to be shortened, we'll shorten it to December, if you're a December grad. So using this December as an end date of the program I, um, I 20, on your I-20, um, the earliest you can apply is 90 days prior to this, right? So what does that mean? 90 days prior to December 22nd is September 23rd, 2023, which will be in the end of next week. So we will start accepting applications um, next week. And I'm sure, hopefully all of you, after you've listened to what we say today, you will have everything ready to go next week. So as you can see, there is also, we talked about the earliest that you can apply. In terms of the latest that you can apply, there is a 60-day time period after your program um, end date. So USCIS, the agency that is going to be approving or denying your case, must receive this application before the 60th day. So for example, we're going to use again as December graduates, USCIS must receive the application before February 20th, 2024, okay? Now, does this mean you submit an application to USCIS on February 19th? No, 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 no. We strongly advise against applying so late. It is not gonna be good for you. Just remember the earlier, the better. Now, definitely everyone's gonna have different choices that they're gonna make because everyone's case is just so different. And the next few slides, we're just going to highlight things to keep in mind as you go through this process and see what will be the consequences be, right? So we're gonna talk about an early application versus a late application. So in terms of logistics here, the benefits of someone applying early is definitely, um, there's this many. You know, USCIS has such strict uh, deadlines. They're not very lenient. If you miss a deadline, you may be denied and we don't want to see anyone in that position and so we really work hard with the, with all our students to make sure that they're doing the right steps so if you apply early you have time to address any potential problems that could arise right for some reason if um the request is denied or they need more information from your application then you'll have time to uh you know address those concerns um if you once if you apply early, you're going to get that card sooner, right? And then you're going to be ready to start your employment. You'll be ready to go. You also can avoid issues with a mailing address. And this is really important because at the time that, of your application to USCIS, you must provide a mailing address. And this is where they're going to send physical uh, documentation your receipt notice, your approval notice, the actual card, right? This is what you're trying to get, that EAD card. So you want to make sure you have a reliable address that is valid. And we definitely recommend that you should definitely choose an address that is valid uh, for at least three to four months into the future. It has to be a U.S. address. And if you're not really sure what that is for you, maybe you can use a friend's address. But whatever it is, Keep it consistent and choose one reliable address. So the earlier you apply, the earlier you can get that um, card. And because we understand that at the end of a term, people may have to move, things like that. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Now, if you're going to wait and do a late application, there could be some negative effects there, right? So we don't want to see you lose any part of your 12 months of OPT. And due to Fed, due to F1 Fed F1 regulations. Once you pass a certain point um, based on your program completion date, regardless of when the USCIS is going to approve your request, there is a fixed possible latest end date. So if you apply late and USCIS approves your request late, 
you may not be authorized for that full 12 months of OPT. The OPT cannot end 14 months beyond the program end date. It can't be beyond that, right? So they may adjust the start date if they get to your case later, but the end date is not going to change. So you want to, the earlier you apply, it will be better for you. Also, it may be too late to resubmit if there is a problem. Um, remember I said that the latest uh, 60th day, like let's say for December grads is February 20th, 2024. Now, this is that um, end date. Now, if you're a December grad and you only uh, you um, find out after the that date that your application is denied or something, there's no chance to resubmit a new one. And so that would be very unfortunate. So it is definitely better to look at it, to apply early. We also, um, you know, you, the longer you wait, the less control you have of when that OPT start date will be. Um, and uh, if we look at some other pros and cons of um, applying early as opposed to in a late application, and just in terms of your well-being, right? Um, you have a lot going on. This is your final term for most of you. You want to get ready for graduation. You have exams, papers, and tra um, travel plans and things all coming up. So you don't want to add any additional stress. So this is one thing you can do early and move on to another task. When you apply early, you're going to be able to, you know, better focus on your academics, right? There's less anxiety over your OPT application um, because you've, uh, you've already submitted everything and you can focus on your papers and things like that. You'll have more time for your job search because you'll get the card sooner and then you can like look for that job. Um, and you're, because you'll have that you know, card in hand, you're going to be able to give your employer a firm start date, right? So you're one step ahead in that way. But when you apply late, you may miss some job opportunities. Um, there's a lot to juggle, right? You have, we, don't, we, we see students during this time when they may make some more errors just because they have so much going on, so much on their plate. They're applying late. Um, and it's all about, you know, so, uh, adhering to the rules of USCIS and giving them the appropriate documentation that they ask for, right? Um, we also, you know, we don't want to see you risk any delays um, with the OPT application if your address changes. So it is just really important to make sure that you uh, submit early. We can also look now at how this may affect travel. Um, now, this is a very common uh, question. We have a lot of students who you know, it's coming to the um, towards the end of the semester. Uh, they want to make sure they get this OPT, finish up, and travel. Well, if you apply early, you won't have to worry about your application status, right? Uh, if you're abroad, because you will already have an approved um, OPT, you have the EAD in hand, you can have less stress because you'll have all the documents that you need to travel. But if for some reason, um, you know, your application's not approved before your completion end date and you choose and you need to travel, well, then there could be some potential risks there, right? Um, so we don't want to see you in that position. If you're not here, someone has to check your mail because everything will be sent to a U.S. address. So you're going to have to coordinate that. Um, there could be potential problems for returning if you only have a pending application. Um, if you need a new visa, you know, we'll, you could have potential problems there if you don't have all the appropriate documents. And if your application is denied while you're abroad anytime after, let's say, December 22nd for our December grads, then you're not going to be able to re-enter, right, an F1 status to reapply. So to avoid all these headaches, potential headaches, and to have peace of mind, you just want to make sure you apply early. Okay, this question. Do you need a job offer to apply for OPT? We get this a lot. And the answer is, thankfully, no. You do not need to have a job offer to be approved, um, to apply or to be approved for OPT. Um, it is not like for those who have done maybe CPT before, where it's employer specific, OPT is not. And this is really a good thing, okay? D and just an important side note, even if you have a job offer, the gentleman, John, who's going to be at USAS, who's processing, they're not going to process any faster. It is still processed in the order received. So 
it is really important to know that don't wait to apply for the OPT because you think you have to have a job first. You can still apply for uh, the OPT if you don't have a job. So what is the moral of our story here? Don't procrastinate, right? Um, key lesson here, apply as soon as you're eligible. We, the, your, your academic you know, load is only gonna get more intense as the semester progresses. And you don't wanna have to worry about this when you have all your exams and papers to work on. So just to recap this section, um, if you haven't heard me say it enough, <laughs> It is really important that you apply early, and I hope I shared um, all the benefits of why applying early is the best way to go. You know, the later you apply, there's higher risk of potential problems, and we don't want to see you miss out on this great benefit that is there for all of you as F1 students. And on, you know, contrary to what you may hear from your friends or you may read on the internet, you do not need to have a job offer to apply for this benefit. All right, I am now gonna turn it over to my colleague Alexis to cover the next section. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was so informative and helpful. So what we wanna keep going with is choosing that start date and sticking with it. It is your decision and we can't make it for you. OBT begins with the start date. That's where all of the decisions begin. We can't make the recommendation in CVIS to put on your I-20 without it. It all depends on you. Michelle and I are F1 experts. That is our fun expertise. We love what we do. We love our job, but we are not content experts. We don't know what's best for you in your field and what kind of job opportunities you have. We are relying on you to make these decisions. So you do have to make that OBT start date from the 60 days following your program ending. So from that poll that we had at the beginning, most of you are fall grads. If you have an I-20 that goes into the future and you are finishing this fall 2023 semester is your last semester, we're gonna shorten it, okay? And the end date that you will have is going to be December uh, 22nd, 2023. Okay, that is the I-20 end date. The I-20 does not reflect graduation, commencement, uh, your cap and gown, getting your diploma. The I-20 is reflective of your academic program, and that's with the academic calendar, right? And when does the fall semester end? December. So that means the earliest start date that you could ask for then would be December 20. 3rd, 2023. And the 60-day end, right, the latest start date that you could ask for then would be February 20th, 2024. So again, if you want to choose a Monday, go for it. If you want to use a holiday or a weekend, that's fine. But just know that this is also tied to the next question. Can you, and we get this a lot, can you change your start date after you submit your application to USCIS? What do you guys think? No, the US government cannot reach in, grab your application, stop everything to change your start dates. Remember those 8 million applications and adjudications that USCIS does every year? It's impossible. No, you cannot change your start date once your application has been submitted. Now, is that the end of the world? No, that's all right. We know this is not an easy decision, but we're here to help you. Some factors to consider are your job offer. Do you have one in hand? Are you close? Are you interviewing? Do you wanna travel? Do you need a vacation? Do you wanna travel abroad and see your family? Or are you relocating to another city to be in your job? And unemployment time. Remember that OPT is for work authorization for US entities and to be physically working inside the United States. It doesn't mean that you can relax and do other things there, and, but it, the US government is pretty great in that it doesn't expect you to have some seamless full-time job for exactly one year. The US government knows that 
You could change jobs. Remember all the types of employment that Michelle listed at the beginning? You could change jobs or have an additional job. Well, guess what? The US government gives you 90 days of unemployment, but that's it. So three months is very generous, so lucky. But there is a maximum amount of unemployment time. So these three factors are going to help you with your dates. Luckily, we have a couple case studies and some alumni are going to be talking about their experience. We have a spring graduate, but we also have, lucky for you, a fall graduate. So let's take a look at the video and they're gonna be talking about their tough decisions. So there's not necessarily one right decision. It's for you making your risk analysis of what's best for you in your field at your time based on all of those factors. So let's watch. Hello, thanks for joining us today at Ask the Alums. As an international student at Columbia, I know I'm not alone in feeling very stressed about applying for post-completion OPT, especially choosing the start date. I know I can choose a start date from any of the 60 days after my I-20 program ended, but it's so hard to know what's the right one to pick. If you have a job offer, it's easy. Your requested start date would be the day your employment begins but for the rest of us, it's not so simple. It can take an average of three months for USCIS to process OPT applications. So we can't really wait until the last minute to make a decision. I've asked two alums who are now employed on OPT to give us some guidance. Tell us how you chose your OPT start date. Sure, so I was a May graduate, so I had to choose a start date between the middle of May and the middle of July. I didn't have an offer at the time of applying for OPT and I was still looking for a job. I knew I didn't want to choose an early start date right after graduation because I was worried that the 90 day clock for unemployment would begin before I started work. What do you mean by the 90 day clock? Well, OPT regulations allow you to accrue a total of 90 days without employment throughout the entire period of your authorized OPT time. Days of unemployment start counting from the start date on your EH card. Exactly right. So my first thought was to choose the latest possible start date in July to be on the safe side and to maximize the time I might need to find a job. Huh, that sounds like a good plan. I thought so too. I thought I could change my OPT start date if I found a job that started earlier, but when I checked with the ISSO, I learned that you can't change your OPT dates while your application is being processed. Bummer, that really locks you in. Yeah, not only that, I had to travel abroad in late June. Now, obviously you can't start a job and then immediately ask for time off, and I didn't want my time abroad to use a part of the 90 days of unemployment. Luckily, my F1 visa was still unexpired, so I didn't need to go to an embassy or consulate to apply for a new one while I was abroad. So what day did you end up choosing? I finally chose the latest start date in July because of my travel plans and to allow more time for my job hunt. Awesome! How about you? How did you choose your start date? Of course, a lot of same factors apply to anyone applying for OPT, but my situation was a bit different because I finished my program at the end of the fall term, not in May. The program end date for December graduates is the last day of the fall term, not the day in February when they get their degrees. So my 60-day window for choosing an OPT start date began right before the winter holidays. Completing a program in December is a bit challenging because not many employers are going to hire anyone to start during the holidays. If I chose a very early start date, I probably start using up some of the 90 days of unemployment. So I didn't want to do that. Since it can take an average of three months or more for USCIS to process OPT applications, and there's no way to speed up a pending application, I knew it was important to apply for OPT as early as possible. So how early can we apply for OPT? Oh, I know. The earliest you can apply is 90 days before your program end date. 
Exactly. So I began my application in September, even though I didn't have a firm offer of employment yet. Hmm, so how did you make your choice? I was afraid that if I chose a late start date, I might miss out on an opportunity. If an employer wanted someone to begin earlier, I decided to choose a date somewhere in the middle of the six days. Before you start working, weekend days come toward the 90 days limit without employment. So I chose a Monday as my OPT start date and I recommend you do the same. I'm happy to report it all worked out. Fantastic. Thank you both for sharing your experience. To summarize for our viewers, when you're choosing a post-completion OPT start date, you need to consider these factors. The time you need to find a job and the time it takes to get the EAD card in the mail. That you can't change your OPT dates nor can you expedite the processing time. The 90-day limit for unemployment and any international travel plans. And remember, Visit isso.columbia.edu for detailed information on the OPT application process. Thanks again, everyone. All right, so, so to recap, the start date is where you begin your process. Consider all the factors when deciding that start date and you can't change that start date once you apply to the US government. Like Lisa said at the end, use the ISSO website and trust it. I use it every day. I love it. It's the best thing ever. I find everything that I need on the website. It was built for you. So who do you think you should trust? Here's Lisa. She's in your history class. She's an F1 student, but she's from Canada. She told you that you don't need a valid F1 visa when you travel during OBT, as long as you have your EAD card. What do you think? Should you trust her? The answer is no. Go to the ISSO website. So remember that Lisa is Canadian. Canadians are the only country that don't need the visa from the Department of State through a visa appointment. Canadians get their F-1 status through Customs and Border Patrol at the port of entry. So we always want to give you the most accurate information. You and your friend may be in the same program from the same country but do you have the same passport or visa expiration dates? Maybe, but maybe not. So always go to the ISSO website. There are many scenarios that are outlined that are custom built for you. The ISSO website is reliable and we've worked closely with government officials, agencies. We keep up to date with all of the, the latest information and it is built for you in mind. As a Columbia student, and for OBT. It is available to you 24 seven and you can upload through Compass your OBT application, like Michelle said, beginning on the 23rd of September, 24 seven. And the website is mobile friendly. Love that. So website, your best friend, who is already my best friend, uh, we, again, have worked with user experience and content managers, content strategists to give you the best website possible. So everything that you need is there. The interactive date calculator is awesome. The, the webinars are super. So we've tried to put as much travel information, e-forms, USCIS, hints for your application. It's all there. Just to make sure, let's go on a tour of the ISSO website. So here we go. Hello, and welcome to the ISSO website. The purpose of this short video is to go on a brief tour of the website specific to post-completion OPT. We'd like to show you how easy it is to use and highlight some important topics. 
To begin, we will scroll over the header Employment, and under For Students, we will click on F1 OPT after your program. As with all our web pages, you will see details relevant to each page and topic. As we continue to scroll down, we'll see quick links indicating what is covered on the page, such as eligibility, important information to know before you apply, and an application process overview. As long as you carefully follow our ISSO instructions, there should be no issues with your OPT application. Here, you can see our OPT calculator, which you can use to figure out the range of dates you can choose from for your start and end date of OPT. We would now like to highlight another important topic, travel during OPT. Information on this topic can be found by hovering over our Visas and Travel tab. Under four students, we'll select Travel during F1 OPT. It is important to know if you are traveling and plan to return before the program end date on your I-20, since your re-entry will be based on your return as a continuing student. In this scenario, your OPT application has no impact on travel regardless of whether it's pending or approved, since you're currently enrolled and will return to the U.S. before the end of the semester. With the pending OPT application after your I-20 program end date is passed, we recommend that you remain in the U.S. until your OPT application is approved. This is because if you're abroad and your OPT application is rejected or denied, you will no longer be eligible to enter F1 status to apply again for post-completion OPT. That being said, there are certain circumstances where an F1 student may want or need to travel with the pending OPT application after their I-20 program ended. If this is your situation, please see the documents here. These are the documents that we recommend you have with you when you request entry back into the U.S. We also recommend flying to JFK or Newark, as we have interacted with those CBP Customs and Border Protection officers. Finally, with an approved OPT application and your EAD in hand, traveling as an F1 student is far less complicated. Below, you will be able to see the documents that you require as you are still in F1 status while in OPT after graduation. Thank you! Super great, love it! So, four things, right, that I want to emphasize that everyone's passport has an expiration date. That's fine. There's information and links on the travel and visas uh, page on renewing your passport in the United States. Remember that OPT is still a benefit of the F1 student visa. So if your visa expires and you're outside the United States, that's okay. You can go for a new visa appointment and you're still applying for F1. The EAD card, it is to onboard. That's what you need to I-9 with an employer. The EAD card in and of itself is not a travel document. You can't forget your passport, forget your I-20, forget the visa, and just come in and out of the United States with the EAD card. The EAD card is for work authorization. It is part of the package of information documents that you need to re-enter and travel on OPT. And if you don't have a job search and you or a job offer in hand, that's okay. And you need to travel on an approved post-completion OPT, it's okay because anything for about these things can count as a, a job search using or printing off your LinkedIn, talking with recruiters, your attendance at alumni networking events. There are many, many things where you can document your job search and having that ready to explain to a Customs and Border Patrol just in case. And again, JFK in Newark, they're super nice, super great, love them. So here's our website, bookmark all of the information for, again, employment, that drop down has the information on OPT. The visas and travel tab has information for traveling on OPT, as well as obtaining a new visa. Also, if you have any questions about specifically about your situation, um, we may not be able to get to everyone's question uh, about dependence or something complicated. 
we want to give you the best answer and look in your record and see what your dates are. So if you need to book an appointment, if you need to email us, or if you have difficulty navigating the website, we have a call center. So keep this checked and come back and use it frequently. To recap, your friends are your friends, but what should you trust? The ISSO website. And we had it with you in mind. It is easy to navigate and sometimes OBT, right? It can feel daunting, but we've broken it down into chunks, into sections, and it is in the order of which you need to do things. So important reminders, USCIS online application. You may have friends, or maybe you even did it a long time ago, where you mailed your application to USCIS. We're happy to say that the online application is very, very easy and efficient and accurate. The other advantage of, of, of filing online is that they can take out your money and you get receipted. You have your uh, case number. You know that the government is going to be taking and accepting your documents. Michelle was talking about the timeline for USCIS. The ISSO, we're working as hard as we can. We know that you're doing the best that you can with the information that you have with your employer. But do you think any of us can make the US government go faster? No. So what we're seeing in real time now really is around three months for adjudication. The only new uh, feature that came out during the spring is something called premium processing. And we're happy to say that it is working, but it is expensive. So in addition to the $410 that you will pay to USCIS, the premium processing fee is an additional $1,500. The bonus though, or the good, th the good part of the premium processing is that instead of three months, you get a decision from USCIS within 30 days. And more important reminders, if you are studying abroad on an exchange program, or if you're doing that PhD research abroad, you do need to return back to the United States to apply from inside the US. Again, OBT is a US work benefit. The US need government needs to make sure that you're here. And part of the information that you upload as part of your online application is your I-94 record. JFK can get more than 45,000 visitors in one day. They're not perfect. They make mistakes too. What if they entered you as a tourist instead of an F-1 visa? Mistakes happen. Again, your I-94 is part of the application materials. They need to see that you are inside the United States in the correct status in F-1 duration of status. Okay. So remember, need to be here. In, at the time of your OPT application. And Columbia will still be your visa sponsor when you're approved. That F1 visa benefit, that OPT, still means that you need to report all of the great things that are happening to you on post OPT back to the ISSO. That means if you have a freelance, if you're starting your own business, if you're doing unpaid or volunteer work, if you have a full-time gig, all of that information has to come back through Compass to the ISSO. This is important because SEVP is reviewing OPT employment records to ensure that students do not exceed the 90 days of employment. And again, at, this is the government database. They do have the capability to terminate records. So, and once it's terminated, it may not be up to uh, Michelle and I to help activate or to fix your uh, CVIS record. So remember, as soon as you get that job and you are seated at that job with that start date, please report your employment within 10 calendar days. 
So remember, your application is super important. We're here to help you, but it is one of many. We know how hard you worked uh, in order to get this benefit and what it means to you and your academic career to your experience here in the United States. And this is only the beginning. Again, once you get your EAD card, use the ISSO website to stay informed. If we have any updates from Customs and Border Patrol, USCIS, or ICE, we're going to post it in the news feed. We also have videos that are updated, right, online in our video library. It's great. And any of those reporting uh, obligations, it's very easy to use in Compass for your company's name, the address, your start date. And then also, if you ever move, there's another Compass login for your personal address. So remember, Columbia is still your visa sponsor, and we need to know what you're doing on OPT. So there are many things that you can control, the job market, the economy, but what can you control? Apply early, choose your start date, and use the ISSO website. So you do have the power to make this process easy. Remember only two steps, applying to us, and applying to USCIS, 